Welcome back, everybody, to another shocking episode of Lockdown 23 and 1. So yesterday, we reacted to an old documentary coming from Georgia, a notoriously violent facility called Smith State Prison. And during yesterday's episode, I'll keep it linked in the comments section if you want to run it back. We left off with the correctional officers going into cell blocks doing shakedowns because of all the violence. And the amount of shanks and metal that they found in just one cell block was unbelievable. These documentaries are about 10 years old, but you know, I've never seen them before. And I'm giving insight to situations that these documentaries don't tell you. So let's jump back into it and see what else they might find or what other kind of issues might come across their path. Now, this guy is the lieutenant of the facility. We were following him on the first part. And also, we're going to start off with the inmate by the name of Hawkins here, giving himself a clean shake. And I have never in my life seen someone do this with their razors in the toilet. I don't care how clean it is, man. Even if it's my own shitty toilet. I ain't cleaning the razor right next to the damn hole like that, man. No, sir. See, there's a lot of people in lockup that will sit there bathing everything in their toilet, man. You know, like clean their clothes and bird bath, all kinds of stuff. Cook wine. Not me, man. The past memories of turds floating down that hole would keep me far away from it no matter how clean it looks. This guy don't care, though. He put it inside the hole. Oh, the good old lights out. Time for night night. I guess violence comes to those who search for it or those who, you know what I'm saying, violate the code. What? But at the same time, <laughs> you mind your business, stay to yourself. You don't have to worry about all that. I know, you know that's right. Very true. You know, minding your business is definitely key to survival and lockup. But this is the thing. I've told y'all plenty of stories in the past where I've seen individuals that were minding their business still get taken advantage of in the worst ways you could think of. Sometimes minding your own business, sticking to yourself could be very dangerous. That's why it's always nice to get out there and mingle, man. Even if you're not really a people's person, you want to try to find someone to hang out with. I didn't join no gangs in prison, right? I didn't have no one to lean on in that kind of way. I was considered a lone wolf, but at the same time, I had a couple friends, a couple pals that I chill with almost every day. Even though we're not gang banging, man, you know, some guys still think that we would have each other's backs. Even though deep down, I knew ain't none of us have each other's backs like that. I've seen it too many times, man. Buddies of yours getting into the mix, they turn and run real quick. The majority of the time, especially if there's a threat of violence or maybe losing your life, they're going to sit in a cell, watch everything unfold, and then come out and help you after the fact. Like, damn, man, your face swolled up, bro. What happened? I don't know, bitch. Where have you been at? I've been feeding you fucking donuts and honey buns since I got here. You couldn't come hold me down a little bit? I've literally seen conversations like that unfold. Maybe not word for word, but, you know, very close to it. So, yeah, mind your business. Do your own thing. But at the same time, try to find someone to kind of kick it with. But don't ever expect them to stand up with you. When I first got here, I was walking to the mess hall. Hold on, man. Does that guy got nighttime trousers on? How the f did he get those? If you're to ask me, homeboy got money. And it was a dude behind me. And uh, I told him, I said, man, I'm free. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, he looked at me like, he said, you free? I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, where the hell you been at? I said, I've been on high max for about 17 years. He said, boy, you free. In case you didn't understand what he said, uh, and this is actually very common to see. Guys coming into the cell block for the first time, they're highly energetic and happy to be there. It's probably because they're, like this guy just said, he was on maximum security lockdown for 17 years. Maximum security, for anybody that doesn't know, 23 hours in a cell with one hour out. Or sometimes it could be 22 and 2. But for him to be in there for 17 years, okay, he had to have taken some cheeks and a life or two. Or severely beaten and injured a correctional officer. If he killed a correctional officer, he would never have gotten off of Max. So that leads me to believe that he did something to an inmate. But I ain't gonna lie, his demeanor, his smile, his laugh is a very contagious one you know there's people in lockup that you know they're not really doing anything funny but for some reason when they tell stories or speak they're just funny 
They're saying three years ago, they had the camera crew go into another prison, a maximum security prison when it first opened, and he was there at the time. This is him, and probably his story from three years ago before they put him into the lower security pod that we just seen him in. And the guards say that he's one of the most dangerous inmates in Georgia. You know, it makes a person feel some kind of way being escorted like this, right? A lot of inmates, they take pleasure in it. They're like, yeah, they got to have four guards and a guy carrying some non-lethal rounds just to carry me to another cell. That's what I consider badass. Unfortunately, that's how a lot of inmates think, man. It builds up their whole view of their self in their own mind. And they'll take that and run with it later on in life, almost like a badge of honor. I know prison wasn't made to be easy, you know what I'm saying? But you got to understand that I'm still a human being. And if you strip me of that mentality and that thought that I'm a human being, naturally I'm going to act like an animal. But the facts here are he was charged with aggravated sodomy. And it don't matter where you're at, man. Most of the time, the guards and the inmates are not going to treat you like a human when they see that kind of paperwork. They're gonna treat you like some sh stuck to the bottom of their shoe. That's just how it goes, man. That is a gruesome charge to have in lockup. I got life sentence in 40 years. When I get frustrated and anger, I gotta take it out on the officer because that's who gonna deal with me. You wanna come in here for eight hours and make my time hard? I going to make my eight hours your eight hours. Now he's saying that he's battling with the correctional officers, this, that, and the third, but if you were to ask me, these are the type of situations that could happen when people have bad paperwork. Believe it or not, they'll continuously attack the guards to make sure they're stuck into a PC style unit or a maximum security segregation cell block. It keeps him separated from the rest of the population, even though he's doing it in a way that many inmates will look at it as a stripe added to your belt kind of situation by attacking guards, you know, inmates kind of like that. But it doesn't diffuse the fact that he's in there for sodomy. As soon as inmates find that out, man, he's gonna be on the chopping block guaranteed. I'm not saying that that's what this guy's doing. I'm just saying that a lot of inmates with bad paperwork, they check in by attacking the police over and over again to make sure that they are far away from the general population and a lot of guards see this and they say you know what it's time to go to gp for you and give win to the inmates that you're coming you know so i actually got a story coming your way tomorrow about a situation like that a lot of people think that the guards are there to protect you but in many prisons man the guards are there to make money and go home and not to mention you get on their bad side they're there to torment you not because they're supposed to but because they're evil individuals as well worse than many inmates we're gonna see who win that battle right now I'm gonna do what I wanna do when I get ready to do it. And I don't think it's too much you can do to stop. You got an officer coming to my door. He do something to my tray as far as, you know what I'm saying? He might drop a piece of bread off the tray. And he might say, well, you know what I'm saying? I'll go up to the mess hall to get you a piece. I might not want you to go up to the mess hall. You shouldn't have dropped that piece of bread. And I'm gonna have to wait for you to serve all the rest of these inmates to bring me a piece of bread. No, it ain't working like that. I might not be in the mood for it to work like that. I've heard many stories of guards not liking certain inmates in these segregation units, man, and they will do some treacherous stuff to them trades, not to mention the inmates trustees sabotaging these trays themselves because the guys that they're feeding in this particular cell block is hated by so many so when you have certain kind of paperwork man it's a guards inmates and nurses all of them are gonna look at you differently a piece of bread no it ain't working like that i might not be in the mood for it to work like that i've eaten off trays exactly like the ones they're shoving through the chucks right now you open up tray flap you know what i'm saying you tripping put a fade down now you put that razor up on him. Hold on, man. They, there ain't no way they're bringing this quarter-link chicken boss trade to the segregation unit. <laughs> 
and maximum security if they're being like this check me in what is that blue stuff on it though i don't know what the hell that is they forgot to take the tag off the chicken it don't matter i'm still crushing that damn thing man them bones be clean as hell by the time they come back look like they got a little bit of applesauce maybe or cinnamon apple snack with a little bit of collard greens man this is a boss tray they don't even serve chicken in the majority of places anymore i used to make sure when they were serving chicken that i had about three or four of these quarter links now just picture me man uh 510 normal size individual in prison with a stack full of chicken and the line of all the inmates coming from all the housing units had to walk right past my damn table man i was getting cat called more than a woman and walking in a g-string in new york city hey bro friend amigo let me get some of that chicken damn that hot sauce looking delicious let me get a lick let me just hold one of them legs till next week man hey bro those thighs are looking delicious why don't you spread a couple pieces apart for me you talking to me or the chicken bro back the fuck up <laughs> damn that tray looking Come good on, you scald them in the face, you know, with some hot liquor. That's how you get them. But that is ways that people in maximum security attack correctional officers. Wait for the chuck hole to open up. If they lean down to make sure the tray goes in nice, they'll slash them across their face. Or they'll squirt them with a bottle full of the worst things you could possibly imagine. That comes out of the human body, trapped in a bottle cooking for weeks disgusting the smell of it you'll never forget it or some kind of scolding hot water or liquid you know there's plenty of ways where inmates can start a little fire in there and cook up some hot stuff but other than that there's really nothing else that they can do so you know a lot of guards they'll come through serving these type of individuals with face shields or other type of things to keep them safe from liquids or razor blades coming through the chuck hole now we're jumping back to Smith State Prison, and it seems like the CERT team is going to be handling some more situations. Things have been uneasy around this facility since the attack of the correctional officer. Everyone's kind of on high alert, especially the COs. They don't know if it's going to happen again by someone else. So this special team, like I said, the CERT team, kind of like special forces for the military, comes into these cell blocks and trying to find weapons, signs of blood, or just get intel from other inmates. But they're headed to a housing unit because two inmates got into a fight. One has abrasion on his face and a stab wound on his arm. Hey, go ahead and put your hand behind your back. When y'all moving, y'all keep your hands behind your back. Move straight in that room over there. So this is the beginning of the shakedown. You know, the lieutenant, he has a little bit of intel what's going on. He already knows the drill. He's trying to find a weapon. Will you find that one? In the trash. Evidently, somebody saw us coming and throwed all this stuff in the garbage. See, they're pretty clean. So there's probably another weapon around here somewhere. Oh, yeah. They probably throwed it somewhere out. It's hard to say. They could still be holding on to it. They could be trying to get rid of it as we speak. But yeah. I think uh, Domitory knows what happened, but uh, they, they want to handle it themselves. So they're checking the shanks for possible signs of blood. They're saying that majority of them look like they're pretty clean and non-used yet. And you know, the first thing that I did after I stabbed someone, you know, the crime that led me to prison, was go into my house and I washed off the blade. Then I threw the blade. My mom was sitting right there in the bathroom asking me what the hell's going on, watching me rinse blood off of a big ass knife with bleach, right? You know, it's because in my head, everything was going, I thought it might have killed him. I'm like, man, I gotta wash off this blade and hide the evidence. So what's to say that inmates ain't thinking the same way? Wash the blade off with some disinfectant, some Lisa soap, get it nice and pearly clean, and then toss it in the trash can. So. They can't just be looking at these shanks with a flashlight to figure out if there's blood on it. Even though the chances are there will be remnants of blood on these things, you know, especially if they got tape or some kind of cloth handle. They're also saying that the inmates know exactly what happened, but they're not going to say nothing because they want to handle it themselves. 
Turns out the guy that got stabbed was being sent out of the pod. Sometimes a bunch of inmates don't like you and they will force you out, get you to roll it up. And most of the time, it's usually peaceful. You might get beat up before you leave or something, but usually they'll grab your stuff and just throw it to the door. And sometimes in more serious situations, maybe you're a snitch or have really bad paperwork, they'll stab you on your way out. And that's what the situation is today. The inmate's property was packed up and put outside the door. Usually when that happens, other inmates have gotten together in the dormitory and are forcing this inmate to take protective custody or move out of the dormitory. Right now, all we have is one inmate that, that may be involved. Sometimes, once you start investigating, there, there's actually more than that, that that we're tied into. It. And those more people that might have been a part of it, guess what? If their name gets brought up in any kind of way, I mean any kind of way, they're going to the side pocket as well, the whole segregation, whatever you want to call it, until the investigation is over with. I've seen guys sit back there for three to four months under investigation for something they really had nothing to do with. They were just close contact with the people that did it, and they are probably part of the organization as well. While they're doing a search of the dormitory, we're going to do some uh, quick interviews of the inmates, see if anybody's willing to talk, see if anybody knows anything, and, and go from there. Now you see what they're doing. They're trying to gather the intel, and there's many ways that these correctional officers can do it. I'm going to tell you a crazy story about these type of interrogations, but first let's talk about how they might do it. Like you've seen this guy, he walked into the cell, closed the door, not all the way, but enough to where the inmate feels like it's private, right? And an inmate, if they feel like their privacy is good and no one's hearing or seeing nothing, then they're going to open up, man. Especially if they don't like the inmate, they're going to tell everything. Not to mention a lot of these guys, they don't like violence in the pod. They, they're just trying to do their time and go home. So any chance they got to get rid of the violent individuals in there, they're going to, especially if they're completely private when telling it. And it ain't just going to be his cell. The COs are going to walk to every cell in there. That gives them even more opportunity to open up and speak about what's going on because they're doing it to everybody's cell, not just theirs. What could get you tricked up, though, is the amount of time that the CO's inside your cell. If he's in there for 15 minutes, obviously you are telling him a little bit more than something. So if you're planning on selling, man, which I wouldn't suggest you doing, but you better tell it fast because they are definitely keeping the time track on how long that CO's in your cell. The inmates, right? They hear and see everything. Now, the funny story about this type of situation happened to me is, believe it or not, uh, I was in Virginia Beach City Jail when this took place. A massive fight. Someone got severely injured. And what the COs did, instead of walking to the cells and going in them one by one, they called each cell out one by one to the sally port. Keep in mind, the sally ports are complete plexiglass. So everyone's watching everyone going in there, see if they're talking a little more than they should. But I'll never forget, the corporal at the time happened to have been my wife, Brittany's uncle. Right, man, it was crazy. Every time I seen him come into the block, you know, because her family didn't like me, man. They would always look at me funny. And I'd have to hide the poker chips really quick because I felt like he was coming at me. But it was never as awkward as when they called me out and he was there doing the question. Knowing that that's my wife's uncle, man, it was very strange. I didn't say nothing, of course, because I'm solid as a motherfucker. Turns out, I think he likes me now, though. A majority of her family. They might have thought I was the type of guy that would break her heart, you know, but I definitely wasn't. But unfortunately, I got some bad and good news for y'all. Bad news is we're going to wrap it up right there. Good news is I've already reacted to another hour's worth of content. So stay tuned. We'll pick up right where we left off on the next episode. And I'll keep all these links so you can kind of piece it together and watch it from the beginning. But I drop content every single day. So I got to make sure that I don't lay all my ducks out in one moment. You know what I mean? It's all about that stamina. But hopefully you enjoyed and learned something and got a few laughs at the same time. Until the next time, as always, y'all be easy, be safe, and stay free.